So moving down, moving out now from the hardware layer, uh, we will now go into the software space. So a software thread is a sequence of instructions that are executed by a hardware thread. So there can be many software threads, and there can be more software threads than there are hardware threads. And the hardware threads will execute um, the instructions in a software thread. And there are different ways where you can prioritize which software threads can get executed first. So there can be many software threads and the operating system schedules software threads to run on hardware threads and thread teams as those hardware threads are free. So once a thread team finishes executing, um, executing their software threads and they're finished, then the operating system can schedule more work to these, these hardware threads. So a software thread is a sequence of instructions that is executed by a hardware thread. So in GPU computing, we often perform compute operations using kernels. So these are small lightweight software threads that are designed to be run in parallel over the available hardware threads in a GPU. So each one of these, um, each one of these um, hardware units inside your compute unit is associated with executing the instructions or the floating point or integer instructions um, that are part of a kernel instance or a software thread. Okay, so that's the mapping that that occurs. And it's the runtime's responsibility, such as the HIP runtime's responsibility to make sure that um, that software threads are scheduled to available hardware threads. And it's your responsibility as a programmer um, to make sure that there is enough work available for all the hardware threads on a GPU to be fully utilized. So, so it's the runtime's responsibility to make sure that the software threads run on available hardware threads. And it's your responsibility as a programmer to make sure that there is enough work for the GPU to do. Okay, so in GPU computing, we perform compute operations using kernels. And this is an example of a kernel right here. So this is um, C, well, C, C++ code. And what this does is this performs a simple vector addition. So memory allocations, a, B, and C are brought into the kernel. And we've got a piece of code here that gets the kernel's position within the grid. So we're going to talk about the grid in just a second. But um, this is a bit of code to get our kernel's position within the grid. And then you've got this little piece of um, mathematics here that computes um, a, at a vector C at index I0, we're going to compute the result of the vector A at I0 plus the vector B at position I0. So we're, we're getting our position in the grid and we're using that offset to index into memory allocations that are defined, these memory allocations are defined in global memory on the GPU. So a kernel, a kernel is a very lightweight, um, a very lightweight software thread that is designed to be run in parallel by the hardware threads in a GPU. So let's now talk about the grid. So when we launch a kernel, we need to specify just how many kernel instances are needed to cover the domain of this vector. So say you had a vector, vectors C, A, and B, and each of those vectors was n elements long. So we need to schedule enough kernels um, to, um, to compute the result for every element in 
these this vector operation. So, so you've got a vector of length, let's say three vectors of length n, and you've got this kernel here, which does the math operation on a single element of those vectors. So this leads on to the grid. So we need to specify how many kernel instances are needed to cover the domain or the size of the vector. So the grid is a three-dimensional rectangular and discretized execution space. And the size of the grid is determined when we, um, when we launch a kernel. So when we talk about launching a kernel, that means that we choose a kernel that we have prepared and then we run it on the compute units and hardware threads of a GPU. And we have to decide how many kernels to launch. So we do this using um, the grid. So that we specify the size of the grid when we launch the kernel. The vendor's software runtime makes sure a kernel is executed at every point in this grid. So the grid is a 3D execution space. So a bit like a nested series of for loops or do loops in, in case of Fortran. So grids are divided into blocks. So we might have a grid here. So this is a three-dimensional grid and it is divided into blocks. Okay, so a single element of each block is called a thread in software space. So don't confuse this with hardware threads. Every thread is synonymous with a kernel execution on in a software thread that is run on a hardware thread of the GPU. So every thread in um, every thread in a block. So the grid is divided up into blocks, and every block is of the same size. So a block might have um, it might have eight elements in the first dimension, dimension X. It might have eight elements along dimension Y, and it might have um, one element, for example, along dimension Z, the last dimension of the block. And so these these blocks um, are put together to compose the grid. So in this case, our grid has um, has two elements, sorry, two blocks along the x dimension. So that's our grid dimension has two blocks along the x dimension, and we have two blocks along the y dimension and two blocks along the z dimension. Now every block has eight threads along the x dimension, eight threads along the y dimension, and one thread. Um, along the Z dimension. Okay, that's just a choice. You as a programmer have a choice to decide how big each block is, how many elements are in each dimension. And so we've got some, we've got purple threads, which means that the computation is finished, and we've got white threads, which means the computation is unfinished. Now you can't as a programmer make any assumption as to the order in which these blocks are executed. They might be executed in any order. Okay, um, so, so when you're designing kernels you can't make any assumptions about um, which blocks are going to be executed first. All right, so and also you as a programmer are responsible for choosing the sizes of the blocks. Now there are limits in the runtime as to how many threads you can have per um, yeah, 
there are limits in the runtime as to how many threads you can have per block. And um, there are also limits on how many threads you can have along each dimension of the block. So the, the, um, the runtime imposes limits on how big your blocks can be. And at execution, what the runtime does is it divides up these blocks and maps them to hardware thread teams. And so this block, this block here is 64 threads in size. So that would map across to one thread team. But you could have blocks that cover more than one thread team. So you could have blocks that cover two thread teams. And an ideal choice for your block size will be so that there is an integer number of thread teams that are required um, to, to cover a block. OK, so that, uh, that is our grid. And you will have noticed that this terminology here, so block dim is, oh, so block dim and grid dim are um, structures that are available inside a kernel. So block ID or block IDX is a structure that is available um, in HIP and in CUDA, block IDX, and that gives you the index of the block within the grid. Block dim.x gives you the size of each block along a, a dimension of the grid. And thread idx gives you the index of a thread within a block. So this calculation here functions to get your index along a particular dimension, in this case, the x dimension of the grid. Now, I think we had a raised hand from uh, from Alexis. Yeah, go ahead, Alexis. Yes, Toby, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm just curious because I have never tried. I have always been very obedient. But yeah, can we can we choose because the, the size is our choice, but not very, isn't it? It needs to be a multiple of uh, yes. the wavefront size. Um, ideally. Ideally, yes. The right choice for the block size will be a multiple of the wavefront size. Yes. Yeah, that yeah, would be the but, most ideal choice. But if we don't, um, the compiler will complain or oh, it will just no, get No, you are free. You are free to choose the block size within limits within the limits set by the runtime. It's mm -hmm. just that if you choose a block size that is not an integer number of um, hardware threads in a thread team, then some of those threads will not participate in the solution. And so you're not using all of the available compute power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thanks. No worries. Now, when you are optimizing kernels, the block size, and the number of threads along a block is actually very, very important. So when you're optimizing these, um, when you're optimizing your software, um, the choice of your blocks along each dimension is something that is, um, so performance is something that is a nonlinear function of your number of threads along each dimension of your block. And, and it has to do with how memory is shuffled in and out of the cache hierarchy. So when you are optimizing code, it is good to experiment. And sometimes you could maybe even op optimize uh, what is the ideal block size or the number of threads along each dimension of your block. So that's something that you could explore. And, and the difference, the difference in doing so um, can, you know, can be significant. 
So in the HIP course that I teach, there's actually a factor of about 50 times um, difference between the lowest performing block size, which would be one by one, um, the lowest performing block size, and then the highest performing block size. So it is important um, it is important when it comes to performance, your choice of um, of block size. Generally speaking, as a first pass, a square block is uh, generally pretty good. It's a pretty good choice as a square block size. But if you can avoid hard coding the number, I mean, we know that AMD GPUs have 64 hardware threads to a wavefront, but that might change in future. So it's good not to hard code um, the block size in your code. So it's it's good not to hard code the number of um, the number of um, threads in a block. It's good not to do that. You can you can I think yeah you can explore and interrogate the number of hardware threads that are that are um, in in each thread team. So you can make choices that way. Okay, do we have any remaining questions with regards to the grid? Okay, yep. So just finally, the grid dim structure is also available. I haven't used the grid dim in this calculation here, but the grid dim.x.y.z, that's that specifies the number of blocks in each dimension. So block dim specifies the number of threads in each dimension of the block. Grid dim specifies the number of blocks in each dimension of the grid. And then you've got block IDX, which is the index of the block along each dimension of the grid. And then thread IDX, which is the index of the thread along each dimension of the block. OK, so memory allocations and memory access from a kernel. So a GPU computing framework provides the means to allocate and deallocate memory on the compute device. And that memory will be typically located in the global memory space, so in the video memory of the compute device. So on Satonix, you have 64 gigabytes available per GPU at, in which you can allocate memory. So a contiguous allocation means just one big long chunk of memory that is allocated. So a contiguous memory allocation is thought of as being one really long array of bytes whose memory is interpreted as different data types according to the pointer that is used to access it. So in the memory, so in the diagram below is some sample memory allocations. Now they're all 16 bytes in size, but depending on the pointer type that you use to access that memory, that memory is interpreted in different ways. So in this instance here, we have interpreted or we are accessing this memory using an int8 pointer. So a pointer to type int8. And that pointer points to the first element at index zero in the allocation. So that's that our pointer. And we access this memory allocation through that pointer. And every element is of type int8. That same allocation we can access using um, an FP16 or a short type. So that same allocation can be interpreted as eight 16-bit um, floats. That same memory allocation can be interpreted as four 32-bit floats. That same memory allocation can also be interpreted as two 64-bit floats. So memory allocations are just memory allocations, reservations of memory, and how we interpret those memory allocations is determined by the pointer that we use to access those memory allocations. So the compute runtime allows us 
to choose if this memory allocation is in a private memory space on the GPU. So the private memory space will be in the registers. And that means it is only accessible to a kernel, to a thread. So a thread in software space is synonymous with an instance of a kernel. Or we can allocate this memory allocation in the shared memory space. So this would be the LDS cache on Satonix, and that would be in this shared memory space. You can also allocate this memory in a global or constant memory space, and that would be in this global memory space on the GPU. So you've got different locations where you can access, where you can create memory allocations. So through a set of query instructions, every kernel has its means to find out the number of blocks in each dimension of the grid. You can find out the number of threads along each dimension of the block. You can find your coordinates of the kernel or thread within the block and you can find the coordinates of the block within the grid. So every kernel has the means at its disposal to find out where its position is within the grid. Now you can use that position to calculate an offset into a memory allocation. So that you as a programmer is responsible for that mapping between the kernel's location in the grid and the position in the memory allocation that you are accessing. So for example, this kernel might have this position within the grid, and we are using that position in some mapping operation that we define um, to create an index that we use to access the memory allocation. And yeah, it's your responsibility to yeah, there's no memory safety within um, languages like HIP. Um, so it is your responsibility as a programmer to make sure that the index that you calculate does not run off the end of the memory allocation. Now, there is a bit of an issue with that because GPU runtimes are quite forgiving when it comes to GPU memory allocations running off the end of the array. Unlike CPU runtimes, where if where you have protected memory, so that means that if you run off the end of an allocation, you might run into someone else's program, the memory allocated for someone else's program. So the OS has strict controls over that, and it will terminate your program if there is a memory access violation. And usually that will be like a seg fault or something like that. In GPU runtimes, um, I have not seen a similar level of protections there. So with GPU code, you can run off the end of the array and not be aware of that you're actually doing that. So there are some tools that you can use, particularly with NVIDIA's suite. There are some tools that you can run um, to make sure that you have not run off the end of an array. Uh, that's right. So Jorge is saying you can get extremely funky and undebuggable errors when you do that, <laughs> unless you use a memcheck tool. That's right. It's the worst type of errors. And the reason is because when you run off the end of the array, you are in no man's land. Uh, or no person's land, sorry. Um, you're in no person's land. <laughs> and that means that the elements off the end of the array can be can have any value, including infinity or including extremely high or extremely low values. And so you really don't want to run off the end of the array. And a good a good step in debugging, or a good step in producing software is to run your code through these tools like Memcheck um, within CUDA 
to make sure that your code is not doing these memory access violations. So it's your responsibility though, as a programmer to make sure that this does not happen. So how do we work with multidimensional arrays? Um, in scientific computing, we often work with multi-D arrays. So when you're writing GPU kernels, it's helpful to know how to map a coordinate vector. Um, so let's say you have a multidimensional coordinate vector, I0, I1, I2. That's for each of the dimensions. So how do you map this coordinate vector C in a multidimensional array to a position in a memory allocation? So in the diagram below is an array allocation of 16 elements. And below it are, so there's our memory allocation of 16 elements. And below it are multidimensional arrays of size 242 whose elements are stored in the allocation. So there's two main, there's two main ways. There are more ways, but there are two main ways of arranging memory in a multidimensional allocation. So there's row major, and then there's column major. So in Fortran, uh, column major is the way that arrays are usually implemented. So column major ordering. And that means when I say column major is that elements from one to the next are implemented such that the contiguous dimension is dimension zero. So that's the first dimension of the grid. So the sequence might go, so this, this allocation folded into a column major array of size 242 would go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then it would jump to the next plane and go 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's how a column major array in Fortran would be implemented. But in C, in row major ordering, the last dimension is the contiguous dimension. So we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So you go in that way. So the last dimension is contiguous in row major ordering. I don't particularly like the use of row major and column major because it's um, it doesn't it doesn't quite cover multidimensional cases. Um, doesn't map so a row and a column is a two D thing. <laughs> so, but we're we're using it anyway. In row major, the last dimension is the one that is contiguous. In column major, the first dimension is the one that is contiguous. But what I want you to see with this is that whether or not you use row major or column major ordering, there is a stride from one element to the next. And that stride from one element to the next is always fixed. So if we want to stride um, one element in dimension one in row major ordering, it looks like we have to stride two elements. So from here to here is two elements, from here to here is two elements, and so forth. Now, the stride in the first dimension for row major ordering, uh, in this instance, it's eight. So we need to jump eight elements in this contiguous allocation. We need to jump eight elements to go one element in dimension zero. <laughs> so that's the first dimension of the grid. And that is true regardless of where you are in the grid. So if you want to stride, if you want to jump by one element in any dimension, you just need to know the stride of that. So how do you calculate, um, how do you calculate your position in this allocation if all you have is a tuple of indices. We just need to know the stride vector here. And if you're using zero base, so if you're using C and C++ to index into these allocations, then the position P, position P in your allocation is just the dot product of the coordinate vector with your stride vector. So if you know the stride in 
each dimension. So for example, eight elements in the first dimension, two elements in the second dimension, and one element in the last dimension. So if you know the stride in um, that dimension, then all you need to do is take the dot product of your coordinate vector with the stride vector. And then that gives you your position P in the allocation. And that works regardless of whether or not you're using row major or column major ordering. All you need to know is the stride vector. So, and I've got some examples here of the coordinates and how to convert them into a position P in that in that array. So I'll leave that to your own time to make sure that this math works out. So how do we construct a strides vector? Well, it's real easy. Um, all you need is the number of elements along each dimension of your grid. So not the hip grid that I was talking about before, but the dimension of your array. So the number of elements along each dimension of your array, your multi-dimensional array. So how do we construct a stride vector? Well, for row major, what you do is you put a one at the very last position, and then you've got your um, your vector of array dimensions. So it's two, four, two. And what you do is you multiply that one by the number of elements in your last dimension. And then that gives you, that multiplication gives you the next, the next number in your stride vector. And then you do that again, so two times four, and then that gives you your next number um, in your stride vector. So from four column major ordering, you start with one at the beginning, and then you multiply that one by two. Um, so that's the first dimension, the number of elements in the first dimension. So one by two is two, two by four is eight. So there, there's your strides vector computed for the row major instance and the column major instance. And so using this stride vector notation is really, really powerful because you don't have this instance where you're jumping from pointer to pointer. That's the first thing, that's expensive. So jumping from pointer to pointer is expensive. So we don't, we're not doing that. We're just using the strides to... So once we know the stride in each dimension, we can just add or subtract a stride from our position and we can get anywhere else inside our multidimensional grid. So this is how, this is how we get around in a multidimensional way within allocations of memory that are on the GPU. So you've launched a kernel and this kernel here has access to memory allocations. So memory allocations A, B, and C, and you get your position, you get your position of the kernel within the grid, and then you can, um, you can get, you get your position of the kernel in each dimension. So that's your coordinate vector, um, and you can use that coordinate vector, take the dot product with a stride, and then you've got your position inside the memory allocation. So that's a way, that's a way to map. Um, that's a way to map coordinates to positions in memory allocations for both row major and column major ordering. Yeah, so this, this bit of information here is really important to have completely memorized when you are programming with GPUs. So you need to have this, you need to have this completely understood and memorized. Um, and then it will be easy to stride around in multi multiple dimensions using either column major or row major ordering.